Good morning, Hope Fellowship. My name is Jeremy Lundgren, and I want to welcome you today as we come together to worship God, to be nourished from His Word, and to grow in our faith and love and knowledge of Christ. For each one of us this past week, there have been things that have demanded our attention, perhaps things that have caused us anxiety, and we want to calm our hearts. We want to still our minds now as we prepare to to worship God and give him the honor and reverence that he's due. So would you listen as we prepare our hearts as I read from Psalm 145 for our call to worship. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his works. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desire of those who fear him. He also hears their cry and saves them. Would you join us now as we worship God in song? Majesty, your glory is shining brighter than the moon and the sun. Marveling, we honor and fear you above all gods, glorious and mighty, your awesome and Well, good morning, Hope Fellowship. Listen to God's word from Hebrews chapter 8. Now the point in what we are saying is this. We have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, a minister in the holy places, in the true tent that the Lord set up, not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices, Thus, it is necessary for this priest also to have something to offer. Now, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law. They serve a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things. For when Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God, saying, See that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown to you on the mountain. But as it is, 
Christ has obtained a ministry that is much more excellent than the old, old, as the covenant he mediates is better, since it is enacted on better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion to look for a second. For he finds fault with them when he says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. For they did not continue in my covenant, and I showed no concern for them, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, declares the Lord, I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God, and they shall be my people." And they shall not teach each one his neighbor and each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. For I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. In speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete. And what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Well, as we come together now to pray, to uh, make our uh, supplications and our petitions known to God, to present them before God, we also want to remember to be faithful in presenting to God our tithes and our offerings. That's something we've been primarily doing online these days. You can uh, look on our church website for more details about that. But as we, re- as we remember uh, to be faithful in presenting to God our tithes and offerings, let's, let's go before our faithful God to present to him our prayers. So let's uh, bow together and go before God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you as creatures, whom you have knit together in your wisdom and in your love. Uh, We come to you as just an unimaginably glorious God, our creator. Uh, We come before you who uh, is so loving and so merciful, so compassionate and good. Uh, Lord, we recognize that your ways are far above our ways. Uh, We recognize, God, that you are eternal and infinite, that we, uh, Lord, dwell here on earth, uh, that we're confined by time and space. And yet, Lord, we we long to know you, to be uh, connected to you, to understand our days on this earth, to understand our lives that you have uh, sovereignly orchestrated, Lord, to to understand the, the eternal purposes that you have for our moments and our days, for our Uh, relationships with other people, uh, for, Lord, just the the occupations and vocations and tasks that you call each one of us to, those things that uh, fill our our lives, that fill our hours, that that take our energies, whether it is uh, in our family relationships, Lord, being husbands and wives, uh, fathers and mothers, sons and daughters, uh, brothers and sisters, Lord, those things that you call us to. Uh, Lord, we think within the church, the ways that you uh, call us as a body to uh, minister to each other and to be uh, your hands and your feet uh, to, this, to this needy world, God. We think about um, the, the, the jobs that you give us, the, the means by which you provide for us, Lord. And uh, thank you for the, the good things that you call us to. I uh, thank you that all that we do, Lord, um, you know it, you remember it. Uh, you care for us, Lord, and that, that uh, as we walk in faith through life, that all that we do, uh, Lord, we recognize that, that all that we do is filled with uh, sins and, and rebellions and faults of our own. But Lord, you are uh, redeeming all that we do. You are accomplishing uh, your good and wise purposes through Christ. And we're thankful that you call us to participate in that. We thank you, God, that your spirit is at work uh, in us and through us in this world. Uh, Lord, we're thankful to um, yeah, to just serve you and, and to, to love each other, to, to love others. 
Uh, Lord, we, we acknowledge our sins and our, our um, just, just rebellions and uh, uh, oversights and, and ways, Lord, that we fall short of your glory. Uh, we, we ask for your forgiveness and, and your, your redemption, Lord. We're, we're so grateful for it. We're grateful that uh, we've been reconciled to you, God, and through that we can be reconciled to each other, that we do not have to live uh, in shame. We do not have to build up walls of, of pride or defensiveness or selfishness. Um, but God, we truly can uh, take up our crosses each day. We truly can uh, die to ourselves uh, as, as you call us to do Christ uh, because you offer us the hope of abundant life. You offer us the hope of eternal life. And that's what we desire. Uh, Lord, we, we confess that we're all often enthralled by the things of this world, the fading things of this world. Uh, but Christ, we, we long for you. We desire to know you. We, we long to live in your presence. And so, Lord, would you uh, work in our hearts, as painful as that may be, um, for us to, to let go of things that we cling to in idolatrous ways and help us to, to hold on to you more faithfully. Uh, Christ, we're thankful for the work that you do in our lives uh, we're thankful that you are, uh, are calling sinners to follow you, that you've called us to do so, uh, that you are calling others to. Lord, we, we uh, long to be part of that, that mission, Christ, that you have uh, to seek and to save the lost. So would you uh, continue to use us? Would you continue to use us uh, as a church in, in fulfilling that mission? We thank you that you uh, watch over us, that you provide for us, that you care for us. And Lord, we just pray that you would continue to do that, that you would continue to, to meet all of our needs. Uh, God, we're just thankful uh, as we look in Hebrews today at the, uh, the new covenant that you swore that you would make to Israel because they needed it, because they could not uh, fulfill uh, the demands of the law, uh, because they needed grace, they needed something better. And we're thankful, God, that you have provided that in Christ. We're thankful that uh, it wasn't just something for Israel, but it's for all nations, uh, that it includes us. And so, God, we're thankful that you, um, you provide for us in Christ. Uh, we pray for uh, this day. We pray for uh, uh, Jeff as he preaches, that, that we would um, hear from him, uh, through him, uh, from your word. We pray that uh, we would be encouraged uh, by this uh, letter to the Hebrews in our faith. We pray in your name, Jesus. Amen. Speak, O oh Lord, as we come to you to receive the fruit of your holy word. Take your truth, plant it deep in us, shape and fashion us in your likeness, that the light of Christ might be seen today in our acts of love and our deeds of fulfill in us all your purposes for your glory. Teach us, Lord, full obedience, holy reverence, true humility. Test our thoughts and our our faith to rise, cause our eyes to see your majestic love and authority. Words of power that can never fail, let the truth prevail. Help. 
help us grasp the heights of your plans for us. True sun changed from the dawn of time that will echo down through eternity. And by grace we'll stand on your promises. And by faith we'll church is built and the earth is filled with your glory. Well, hello again, Hope. My name is Jeff Brewer. I'm one of the pastors here at Hope, and it is a joy to be able to be together again here today looking at God's word from Hebrews chapter 8. We look forward in just a couple of weeks on September 13th, we'll begin again our gathering in person. Of course, we're going to still have online options. We'll have a, uh, on, a online sign up for those who would like to participate in in-person worship. Um, and, and so we, we look forward to being able to do that. We look forward to being able to gather connect with one another, whether you're here in person or we're continuing to do so in our mission groups or over the phone as we talk with one another throughout the week. And so um, we're in prayer for you. Please let us know your prayer requests. You can text those uh, to either me or to John if you have our numbers or send them to info at myhopefellowship.org. Well, as we look to Hebrews chapter 8 again here today, would you pray with me? Father, simply we can say we need you. We need your spirit. We thank you that you have given to us your spirit so that we can understand your word. And so I pray that as I spend this time proclaiming your word, that your spirit would be active and working in my own heart. Father, that you would take these words and you would prepare your word to um, be planted deep in our hearts. Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer, in whose name we pray. Amen. Well, I'm guessing that when you wanted to watch, if you watched a movie last week with your family, I I doubt that you first got out the yellow pages And you looked up where your local blockbuster was and then picked up your rotary phone and dialed and called to see if they had your favorite movie on VHS beta format. Just a guess, but I'm guessing that didn't happen. I'm guessing that when you got online this morning, you didn't do so with a dial-up modem and using AOL. Or when you got in your car to listen and you listened to music that you didn't pop in an eight track or a cassette tape. You know, I'm guessing as school starts up that your kids aren't doing their math homework with a slide rule. And, just guessing, when you got home on Friday, the first thing you didn't do was check your answering machine. You know, our world moves forward at such a dizzying pace in regards to technology. But although these technologies have come and gone largely, and and they've made our lives easier or more enjoyable or efficient, really, if you think about it, the technology, it would still work and function if we so desired. You could use an answering machine. I guess you could use dial-up if you could find somebody that would provide it. If you had some old tapes, you could watch a a VHS. But, But as we turn to the book of Hebrews, and we learn about Jesus ushering in the new covenant. It it makes the old covenant obsolete. It's so truly disruptive that the old just fades away. And and right at the beginning of of Hebrews chapter 8, I love it when scripture does this for us. The author of Hebrews tells us the point he wants us to see. And so that's really what I want us to kind of function as um, where we're going to be heading this morning in our points. I want us to look at the one big point we need to understand, the one big word we need to define, and the one big implication that should bring us hope. 
And so the one big point we need to understand that the author is making, the one big word that we need to define, and then the one big implication that should bring us hope. So that's where we'll spend our, our brief time here this morning. So let's look first here at the one big point we need to understand. Now look with me at, at Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1 again. Now the point in what we are saying is this. So in other words, he's saying, here's the point. We have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of majesty in heaven, a minister in the holy places, in the true tent that the Lord set up, not man. Now, you might remember back in Hebrews chapter 4, the author began to show why Jesus is the better high priest. So this theme of Jesus being the great high priest began to show up then. And, and here, right here in Ch- Hebrews chapter 8, after four chapters of going back and forth and talking about this, he stops and he says, now, now look, here's my point for telling you about Jesus being our high priest. So, so what's the point? Here's how I'd summarize it, and then I want us to unpack it. Here's how I think his point is. Jesus is the great high priest who provides the superior offering and opens the door of heaven through the new covenant. Let me say that again. Jesus is the great high priest who provides the superior offering and opens the door of heaven through the new covenant. So, so think back with me over these last few chapters of the book of Hebrews. What's been written about the supremacy of the Son, the fact that Jesus is supreme and, and how he is the great high priest. In, in Hebrews chapter 5, we learn that Jesus is superior to earthly high priests because he doesn't have to offer sacrifices for his own sins. In Hebrews chapter 6, we learned that Jesus is supreme over all who, has come, who have come before him because he's the fulfillment of the promise to Abraham that God swore with an oath that he would fulfill. Then in Hebrews chapter 7, we learned that Jesus is the great high priest after the order of Melchizedek, and so therefore he's supreme over priests who come from Levi. And he shows this because his life, like Melchizedek, we don't know his beginning or his end, we see, he shows this, that his life is indestructible at the resurrection. And so in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 22, really we could say it, it's the summary of all these truths about Jesus being the great high priest, and, and he puts it into one concise statement. He says this, This makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. And so because Jesus is the great high priest, he ushers in the new covenant in his blood. He's the guarantor in his person. But, but if you notice here, if you look back at verse 1, he, he says, notice it says, we have such a high priest. That's, it's present tense. Not, not we will have such a high priest. Not we once had such a high priest. But we have such a high priest. Now, remember, this book of Hebrews is being written to those who are coming from a Jewish background, and some of these, from a Jew, these new Christians from a Jewish background might have been tempted to go back to the old. And so right here, and just reminding them, we have such a high priest. If they saw those priests in the temple, if the temple was still around at that time, if this was before A.D. 70 when it was destroyed, they could see that and they might be tempted to kind of go back and say, look, this is our heritage. This is where we're from. Look at the temple. Look at the priests. But he says, no, we have such a high priest. And notice, what is the high priest doing? It says he's seated at the right hand of the majesty on high. He, he's seated, which shows that he's victorious. He's, he's done with his work on earth. His work on earth and finished at the cross. But though he's seated in heaven, he's not inactive. In Hebrews 7.25, we just saw the last time we looked at Hebrews. Consequently, he's able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. So what's he doing? Seated at the right hand of the majesty on high? He's making intercession. 
he's interceding. His blood was already shed, and so he's not making a sacrifice again. But as he sits at his right hand, the victorious conqueror, his bodily presence with his scars as a constant reminder before the Father that our sins are covered by his blood, that he is our priest. We have such a high priest. Now now look at verses 3 and 4. This Jesus, as the high priest, we see again he's superior to the Levitical priests. He says, For an every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices, thus it is necessary for this priest also to have something to offer. Now, if he were on earth, this is speaking of Jesus, if he, was on, he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law. They serve a copy and a shadow of, a hev- of the heavenly things. For when Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God saying, See that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. So no Levitical priest could or would have thought about offering themselves at the, author, at the altar. It says, so if Jesus is a priest, he has to have something to offer. What did he offer? He offered himself. If Jesus is a priest... He, he wouldn't be, if he was on earth, he wouldn't be a priest according to the law because he's not of Levi. Well, he's of Melchizedek, and so he's able to serve eternally as this priest. You know, Jesus is different because he doesn't offer a, a sacrifice of a bull or a goat, but he offers up himself. And so he's making the point that, that the Levitical priests, they were serving the, the sketch or or the shadow of the heavenly realities. They served the pattern. Jesus serves in the reality of heaven. They offered up bulls just as a picture. He offers up his own blood, his own self. And so Jesus is the superior high priest who made one sacrifice in order to open the door of heaven through the new covenant. That's the point he's saying. In order, all of this about the high priest, he wants us to know so that we understand that fact. So that's the big point we need to understand. Now, what's the big word we need to define? Now, the big word we need to define, it's, it's not a big word with a lot of syllables or it's not a long word. It's not even really that hard of a word, but it's a big word because we don't really use this word all that often. And especially if you're not coming from a religious background, you might never use this word. It might sound kind of like an odd word. And that word is covenant. It's, we don't use it in conversation all that often. But over the next few chapters of Hebrews, he's going to use this word covenant over 14 different times. And so when he uses this word covenant, what he's referring back to is the Old Testament. And and covenant simply means uh, an agreement between two parties that defines their relationship. And so in the Old Testament, God makes a covenant with Israel. This is the covenant, covenant being referred to here. He makes a covenant with Israel that he would be their God, and they would be his people. He brought them up out of the land of Egypt, and then he defines their relationship with the covenant through Moses. And so, as a part of defining this relationship, he, he gives them the law to live up to their responsibilities. And so, there was ble- under the law, there were blessings for obedience. There were curses for disobedience. Now, here, here's the thing, because when we talk about law, it, it's and we're referring back to the Old Testament, we have to remember that the New Testament paints the law as good. It's not sinful. It's not wrong. But the problem with the Old Testament or the Old Covenant was that the law was weakened by the sinful flesh. Because we live in the flesh, because we have a sinful nature, the law was weakened. We're not able to do the things of the law. So it's insufficient to save. So what we see in the Old old Covenant is the people were unable to live up to the requirements stipulated by God. It showed them the standard, but over and over again, they couldn't achieve what the law required. And so in that way, the book of Romans, the letter to the Romans, it, it, it tells us the purpose of the law, one purpose, was to reveal sin. 
So when the Israelites constantly failed in their responsibilities before God in the covenant, they continually were showing they were unable to keep their end of the bargain. They couldn't live up to the covenant. They couldn't live up to the stipulations they had agreed to. God kept his end because he never changes, but they couldn't keep theirs. Which is exactly why God promised a new covenant. Because he knew we couldn't do it on our own. Now, you might say, at least I do, this is how I I think, well, why didn't he just start with Jesus? If the old covenant, if the law was insufficient, why even go through all of that? Why go through all of the temple and the sacrifices and all of those things? And the answer is, because the law in the Old Testament, this is in part, this is a very simple answer. The law and the Old Testament, they reveal aspects of the character of God that we need to know. And so when we read the Old Testament, which we should, seeing the history of Israel and even seeing their constant failures, they provide an example to us of, and they also prepare us that we need a Savior. If we were ever tempted to think, just like maybe the Hebrews were tempted to think, kind of, uh, they'll go back to their old way of life. If we're ever tempted to think, do I really need a Savior? Is sin all that bad? Aren't I really just at my heart a good person? What the Old Testament shows us is, no, there's nothing different. It shows us really the heart of the problem is the problem of the human heart. We have a sinful nature. But, but just seeing our own hearts before Christ, it, it makes us see why the old covenant fails. When we, we look at our own hearts and we know just how prone to wander we can be, it wasn't God's fault. It was the people's fault. They disobeyed. They turned away. And so the law was weakened and ineffective, and it couldn't change their hearts. And their hearts were unable to be solely devoted to God because of their sin. So again, the old covenant serves as a proof that we can't make it to God on our own. So maybe you're watching this or listening to this, and you're kind of thinking, like, I just need to live a better life. I just need to clean my life up, and then God will accept me, or then I'll come to God. Well, it didn't work for the, old, for the people in the Old Testament. It didn't work for the Israelites, because we can't clean ourselves up enough. We can't get our heart to be devoted enough. We'll always fail. And so we need a new covenant. We need a new agreement with God, but it's an agreement we can't make. It's an agreement that has to come from him. And that's why the, he's been talking about the Jesus being our great high priest and why it's so important, because just like the old covenant was ratified with blood, so the new covenant is ratified through the blood of Christ. Now remember, when, we, when we're able to take communion, which I long to be able to come around the Lord's table together when we gather again. He said, Here, remember what Jesus said at the Last Supper. This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. What he's saying is, because of his death, because he was, knew he was going to the cross, there was a transition happening. They were moving from the old to the new, and the difference is the sacrifice. The difference is the Messiah, the Savior. The Israelites couldn't obey God through the law, but Jesus is the man, fully man, who always obeyed. The Levitical priests, they kept going into the temple year after year after year with the blood of bulls and goats, But Jesus is the true priest, the true temple, and the true sacrifice. You know, the kings of Israel, they turned away and they led the people, sadly, away from God. But Jesus is our great king. He's our leader who always rules with justice. Some Old Testament prophets, they spoke false prophecies and they deceived the people. Jesus is the true prophet who always speaks truth and leads us in paths of righteousness. So so in light of this, 
In light of this big word, but this really important central word, covenant and new covenant, let's look at the one big implication that we need to see. So the, what's the big point? What's the big word? Now, the one big implication, and here's the implication. The new covenant is better than the old. The new covenant is better than the old. Now, if you remember, we started talking this morning about technologies that have come and gone, that have become obsolete. But, but sometimes there's debate. Well, is the new really better than what it replaced? You know, back in, back in the day, record players, which is what we called them then, they, they never really, sound, frankly, they never really sounded all that good. They always seemed scratched. They kind of re- got stuck on a loop or re- repeated. And so when CDs came along, they sounded significantly better. So much so that, that kind of people just very naturally, record players just kind of faded away. That is, until they got hip and cool and popular again, and then they came back. And they're not, they're not record players. They're, they're vinyl. You know, we're going to play vintage and vinyl. Now, if we simply think about new and old covenants in the way we would technologies today, we might get confused or, or be hesitant to say that one's better than the other. You know, sometimes people talk like that when they're talking about the old covenant. You're, kinda, you're talking to them and they're speaking in such a way that they're so enamored with the old that they almost forget that the new, they, they seem to forget that the new is is there. Likewise, it actually can be the same as well, that they so focus on the new that they, as if if the old never existed. Well, we we have to understand both, but we have to understand what the author of Hebrews is saying. Look, he's not confused. The new is better than the old. And and he's going to say at the end, the old is obsolete. It's it's so obsolete that it's vanishing away. It's not going to come back as vintage later. Because the substance has come that's replacing the shadow. So the substance is now replacing the shadow. And so, so that's what we, we saw as we saw here these, they, they serve in verse 5, they serve a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things. That, the temple was just a shadow, a copy of the heavenly things. You know, we, we know that the substance is better than the shadow. If you said to a soldier who is deployed in a far off country, that you and um, if they would have their wife and picture, their wife and kids send pictures of themselves, would you like them to do that? Or would you like them to see them face to face? There's going to be no question. Pictures are fine in the absence of reality. But in light of reality, those pictures just fade away. Who's going to hopefully not just sit and look at the pictures when the reality is in front of them? The new covenant it's better than the old because it's the substance. It's Christ. So look with me at verses 6 and 7. But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is much more excellent than the old, as the covenant he mediates is better, since it is enacted on better promises. For if the first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion to look for a second. And so these better promises are the promises of God that he guaranteed with an oath that we saw back in chapter 6 that he made to Abraham. And he guaranteed it by his unchangeable character. And he promised and he guaranteed with an oath that through Abraham he would bring a blessing to all nations. But that ultimate blessing, it, it wouldn't just simply be in Israel or in the law or in the old covenant. Those were just the placeholders. Those were just the shadows. They were preparing us. They were helping us to see the need that we would have for Christ. And so the ultimate fulfillment to Abraham, it looked past the old and it looked squarely at the new in Christ, the new covenant, better promises, better savior, a better priest. But but why else is the new covenant better? Now, and this is where really we could, we could spend our whole time just on this second half here. But let's look briefly here. Look at verses uh, 8 through the end of the chapter. And this is a quote from Jeremiah 31. And if you notice here, the, the quote is kind of, where is he placing the blame on the fault for the old covenant? 
It says, for he, God, finds fault with them when he says, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them up out of the land of Egypt. For they did not continue in my covenant. And so I showed no concern for them, declares the Lord. Now, here's, here's the difference between the law and Christ. When we fail, when the Israelites failed to meet the law's demands, we're left crushed and defeated. We're left guilty and shame-filled. We need, a, we need a new heart. And so, so much so that in the Old Testament, in the Old Covenant, there were these sacrifices happening repeatedly, a constant reminder. But what, we, what we, they needed and what we need in order to obey is a new heart. And that's what the new covenant being prophesied in Jeremiah is telling us. And so what we see here is that because Jesus has come, because he's ministered as the high priest, because he's allowed us into the presence of God in him, our standing doesn't depend on obedience, but on the faithfulness of Christ. So, will we fail? The answer is, in part, yes, we will fail. We won't always live an obedient life. But will we fail like the Israelites and fail to enter the rest? And the answer is decidedly no, because Christ has succeeded for us. He's the faithful Savior. He's the obedient Israelite. He's the true Israelite that could fully obey all of God's law. And he did it for us so that when we believe in him by faith, his righteousness is credited to us. But not only this, He's changing our hearts. He gives us a new heart. Look at verses 10 and 12. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach each one their neighbor and each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. For I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. The new covenant is God writing his law on our hearts. Elsewhere, it, it talks about us having new hearts so that we obey not just to, to the letter of the law, not just kind of saying like, well, how close can I get like maybe like the Pharisees were, but because we have a desire. He gives us a longing to obey him. And also a conviction of sin that when we fall short, that we can repent, we turn back to him, and we can seek to follow him. So we can say we know him, and we want to know him more. But, but don't let your mind skate over that phrase that maybe can just become too familiar. I will be merciful toward their iniquities. I will remember their sins no more. Look, we remember our sins, and, and we can be filled with regret decades later. Sadly, we can remember our spouse's sins, or we can remember our children's sins. Sometimes we can hold it against them, or even hold it against ourselves and just kind of wallow in this shame. But what we have to remember here is, because of the new covenant, God chooses to remember our sins no more because they've all been laid on the sun. He has put all the iniquity upon him, and upon his, upon his, from that, he's given us peace. And so in that way, the law can no longer accuse us because we've been set free from the law's demands. Because we can say, the law says, you must be holy. And we can say, I am holy in Christ and I am seeking to grow in him because he's given me a new heart and new desires. And so positionally, I am holy, and he is making me holy. So the law commands perfect obedience, and we have a Savior who perfectly obeyed. We believe in Jesus, and we're counted righteous. Maybe this morning I can end with an old poem. It's been years since I quoted it. John Bunyan, it, it sums this up well. John Bunyan, who wrote Pilgrim's Progress, he said, Run 
John Run, the law demands, but it gives us neither feet nor hands. So in other words, we can't accomplish it. We can do nothing. Run, law, run, John, run, the law demands, but it gives us neither feet nor hands. What better news the gospel brings. It bids us fly and it gives us wings. God's calling us to obedience still, but he's given to us a new heart. We can move forward knowing that we are counted righteous in Christ, that we have a great high priest who is now seated in the heavenlies making intercession for us. Our salvation is secure. And so our goal, our job, is to delight in our Savior, to treasure him, to seek to do his will and honor him all the days of our lives, more and more and more. That's what we want to do as a church. That's what we long for. And if you don't know Christ today, that's available for you. Let's pray together. Oh, Father, we thank you for your word, which teaches us truth about your son. We thank you that we can see here in Hebrews the main point that we have this great Savior because of his single offering. He has opened up heaven to us so that through the new covenant by his blood. And so, Father, we thank you for this new covenant. We long, even speaking of the new covenant in this way, we long to be together so that we can celebrate the Lord's Supper together. That we can be unified saying, it's only by his broken body. It's only by his shed blood that we are made his people. And so we delight in this separately, longing to be together, praising our Savior all the day long, we say. In Jesus' name. Amen. When this passing world is done, when a song the glaring sun, when we stand with Christ in glory, looking for life's finished story, then Lord shall I fully know. Not till then how much I owe. I stand before the throne Dressed in beauty, not my own When I see thee as the heart Love thee with an sinning heart Then Lord shall I fully know Not till then how much I owe He paid God our debt On the cross of Calvary Jesus bore our sin The Son of Man upon a tree Sin and death we need not fear By His Spirit God draws near When the praise of heaven I hear Loud as thunders to the ear Loud as many waters noise Sweet as harps and lotus voice The Lord shall fully know Not till then how much I owe not for good in me, wakened up from wrath to flee, hidden in the Savior's side by the Spirit sanctified, teach me, Lord, on earth to show, by my love how much I owe, he paid God our debt on the cross of Calvary, Jesus for our sin, the Son of Man upon a tree. Sin and death we need not fear By His Spirit God draws near Oft I walk beneath the cloud Dark as midnight's gloomy shroud But when fear is at the height Jesus comes in all His light Blessed Jesus bid me show Doubting saints how much I owe when in flowery paths I tread, off by sin I'm captive led. Oft I fall, but still arise. The Spirit comes.
Bye. 